All right, well, welcome to Living Hope Church. We're so glad you have joined us this morning. If your children are going downstairs with Miss Melody for Children's Church, they can dismiss out the back. Um, if they're staying with us, there are some activities on that back table that they are free to grab and use throughout the service. Um, so today we are continuing to look at just some standalone narratives in the Bible that display God's love, His character, His mercy, uh, and His grace towards us. Um, and I feel like I say it every week, but uh, this week we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Today we're going to be in Acts chapter 16, if you'd like to head in that direction. But in this story, we're going to see the beginning of the church in Philippi. And we're going to see that the church begins not with the expected, but the church is going to start with Paul sharing the hope of Jesus with a woman by the name of Lydia. And I love Lydia's story because I believe within her story of faith, we can um, all see ourselves and relate in some way. Um, and it is my prayer for us today that God would use Lydia's story of salvation to call some of us to Jesus for the first time. And that he would use Lydia's story of salvation and faith to call us all to deeper faith, to commitment and love today. So we're in Acts chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 6, but let me give us just a tiny bit of context as we dive in. So as we come to Acts chapter 16, verse 6, Paul is preparing for his second missionary journey. Uh, and it is Paul's desire in his second missionary journey to return to Asia Minor, where he had gone on his first journey. And he wants to go to Asia Minor so that he can strengthen and encourage those churches that he had already started. He also wants to return to help start new churches in the cities and communities of Asia Minor. And from our perspective as a reader and as humans, we hear this plan. It seems like a great plan. And we would say, Paul, go and encourage and strengthen those churches. And so when we get to Acts 16, Paul heads off to Asia Minor and God stops him and continually redirects his plans. That's what we read starting in verse 6. It says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. And so forever, for whatever reason, in Acts 16, Paul's best laid plans, his plans, which come from a heart that loves God and desires to glorify God, we find are not God's plans. And he's hitting roadblock after roadblock. I mean, I don't know about you, but I know I have certainly had those times in my life where you're trying to follow God, you're trying to do what's right, you're trying to do what you think you should do, but the doors just keep closing. And it's so frustrating, but as we will see in Acts 16, God is faithful to close good doors to open the right doors, to open the right paths that will draw us to him and to his glory. I love Psalm 23. It's a famous psalm, but I love the imagery of God as our shepherd or as our leader. In Psalm 23, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And then David says, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. I love that verse 3. Even when doors are closing all around us and we are frustrated, we can trust that if we are following God, then he will only lead us on right paths. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't lead on wrong paths. God doesn't lead us to sin. He doesn't lead us to destruction. But David says the promise is he only leads us on right paths for his name's sake. As we're going to see in Acts 16, God is closing doors in order to lead Paul down right paths for his name's sake. And he is leading him on right paths that are going to lead to Lydia's salvation. And we're going to see Jesus worshipped on a new continent. But I know there are some here today that feel like Paul. You're walking and trying to follow God, but it seems like you're running into dead end after dead end. And the promise for Paul and for you is in this time is that God is good and he only leads on right paths for his name's sake. So you can trust him in the uncertainty and trust that he will lead you and your family and our church in the right direction for his glory. God's timing, God's sovereignty, and his plans are so much better and so much bigger than ours. We see a small slice of what's going on, and he sees it all and has it all in his hands. So that's just an incredible promise to cling to in times of uncertainty and just in times of life. We can trust that God is leading on right paths. And that's what we're going to see with Paul starting in verse 9. So there in Troas, it says, During that night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for uh, Samothrace, and the next day we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. 
So Paul, Paul, if you know anything about Paul, Paul wasn't just a sit-around guy. Uh, he is traveling around Asia Minor. He's trying to return where he's been. He's questioning and asking God, why can't I go? Why won't you let me do what you have called me to do? And God is redirecting him towards his purposes in Macedonia in the West. And then here in verse 9, Paul gets the vision of the Macedonian man asking them to come to Macedonia. And so Paul, it says, immediately heads west. And as Gentiles, as, as non-Jews, which most of us are, these people that live in the West and have a Western heritage, this is the, one of the most important developments in the book of Acts. This is the first time that the gospel ever heads west. The good news of Jesus heads west. Paul longed to take the good news of Jesus back to Asia Minor, but God redirects him west, and the gospel heads towards Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece, and it enters Europe for the first time, and it changes history, and it impacts Lydia for the first time. God is once again sovereignly orchestrating the events of the world for his glory and his good. And as followers of Jesus, we can trust that God is doing the same in our lives. And then I love this. When God moves, Paul recognized it, and he immediately heads to Macedonia. It says, we got ready at once. What a tremendous example for us. When God calls, when, when God moves, when God leads, we aren't called to fight and stall, but we are called to go where he says to go. And we do so proclaiming the good news of Jesus with the world around us. And so that's the background when Paul shows up in Philippi with the hope of the gospel and he meets a woman searching for answers by the name of Lydia. All right, we're going to read about Lydia's conversion here starting in verse 11. It says, From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home, saying, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, Come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this just story of your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for this story of your leading and, and leading on right paths for your namesake. God, we thank you for this story of salvation and forgiveness for Lydia. And so, God, I pray that as we, we study Lydia's story of faith, Lord, that you would speak to us. And, Lord, that you would draw us to faith, perhaps for the first time. Lord, that you would remind us of the faith we have and strengthen uh, our faith moving forward. So, God, I pray, Lord, that you would just lead us. Uh, to be your followers, Lord, and lead us to be sharers of your good news, just as Paul was. So, God, we pray that you would um, just bless this message, that you would open um, our hearts and ears, Lord, and you would give me your words to share. God, we love you, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. So, in the introduction, we talked a lot about Paul. Uh, Paul grew up a Jew. He persecuted Christians, but he encountered Jesus, and his life was changed. And he committed his life to telling people about the forgiveness and hope that can be found through Jesus. Paul was responsible for planting churches all over Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. And, and Paul wrote a large portion of our New Testament that we have today. And so that's who Paul is as we read about him in this story. But um, beyond Paul, I want to give us just a little bit of background on who Lydia is. So who is Lydia? Uh, at first, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of information in this passage, but what Luke shares with us in Acts 16 tells us a lot about who Lydia was. One of the first things he tells us is that she was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, again, that seems kind of like a throwaway detail, but purple dye was rare and was incredibly expensive in the first century. And the only people that could afford it were the incredibly rich or those who were royalty. And so this fact that she is dealing in purple linen informs us that she is a businesswoman, and she is a businesswoman dealing in high-end goods. Now, I, I don't know fashion in any way. You see that in my wardrobe every Sunday morning. But when you hear purple linen, think of a designer in New York or Paris, right? She is dealing in the best of the best. She's likely well-traveled through this trade and well-educated. Luke also lets us in on the fact that she was from Thyatira, which is in Asia Minor. Uh, he had, uh, in Asia Minor, he, he had experience in that region, right? Paul had been to Thyatira. He had been in Asia Minor. And he was trying to go back, but Paul had been blocked from going there by the Holy Spirit. And yet the first person he meets in Philippi, or modern Greece, is a lady from Thyatira. 
I love that because God so often uses the giftings and experiences we have to help us connect with others and to share the hope of Jesus. And that's what we see with Lydia. They have commonality in their travels and life experience. And Paul is going to share the hope of Jesus with her, launching from that point. In our lives, too, God uses our experiences, our joy, our passions, and he calls us to use those things to connect with people and share Jesus with them. So more on Lydia. We also see that she is a, is a wealthy woman. Not only is she dealing in fine purple linens, but she owns her own home, and we learn her home is big enough that she can just invite this group of traveling missionaries in without hesitation and for a prolonged period of time. And so as we think of Lydia in this story, think of a wealthy businesswoman, think put together, think driven, think smart, think well-known, well-respected, and think influential in her community. And really, in many ways, Lydia has it all figured out in the eyes of the world. She seems to have it all together. She has all she seems to need. She, she seems to hold her future in her own hands. But yet we read her soul is searching and looking for more. The other thing we read about Lydia is that she is religious. She is what we in the church would call a God-fearer. She is spiritual. She knows of God. She believes there is a God. She respects God. She is trying in her own strength to follow and know him. And she spends time with other people who believe in and respect God. But we see she doesn't yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior because no one has ever told him, uh, told her about him. And so that's our first point today. Lydia was a God-fearer but she was not yet a Jesus follower. And I think Lydia is such an important person for us to study and understand because we live in a community and a culture that is filled with God-fearers that are not yet Jesus followers. There are many in our community, and you yourself may be a God-fearer, but not yet a follower of Jesus. Right? We live in a nation that was established on Christian principles. Many of us have grown up with, with Christian values in our homes that call us to treat others as we would like to be treated. Many of us view God as a good thing. Many of us have someone in our family that, that was or is a Christian. Many of us may go to church on occasion or weekly, and we, we believe following God is probably a good thing. Right? M most people in our community would agree with um, the country music singer slash theologian Billy Currington that said, God is great and people are crazy. Right? But the Bible is quite clear that believing God is great just going to church, just trying to do the right things, just fearing God does not save us from our sins. The Bible is clear that it is only through following Jesus that we can be forgiven of our sins. The Bible says you can try to do all the right things. You can come to church every time the door is unlocked. You can memorize all the verses. But the Bible says that's not enough if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In fact, the Bible is quite clear that you can't work your way to God on your own. And so it's not enough just to fear God or know about God. You have to experience Jesus' gift of forgiveness and become his follower. And before Lydia meets Paul, that's who she is. She is a God-fearer. She is trying in her own strength to know God. But then she hears from Paul of Jesus, and her heart is open, and her life is forever changed. So what is this message that so radically changed Lydia's life? Well, we don't know the exact words that Paul shared, but we see him share the gospel in other sections of the Bible. And the gospel is the, is the good news of Jesus. It's the story of his hope and, and that we can be forgiven of our sins. And it was Lydia's hope, and it's our hope today. What we do know about Lydia is she was a God-fearer, which meant she likely studied or was studying the Old Testament. And so when Paul would share the gospel with people in, throughout the New Testament, he always began with where they are. And so that's likely where Paul began with her. He likely began with the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are a list of things that God has called us not to do, right? Don't lie, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't covet, and so on. And Paul likely shared with her that it is impossible for us to keep all the commandments in the Bible. It is impossible for us in our own power to completely obey God. It's just not possible for us. And the intention of the Ten Commandments is, is not for us to be perfect, but it is to point us to a Savior who came and was perfect. In fact, Paul in Romans 3.23 shares with us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And sin are all those times when we mess up and we disobey God, when we put our wants and our priorities above His and we go our own way. Paul says that every single person has sinned. We are bent with this nature to sin and do things our own way. Right? I have three children, and we are thankfully out of the toddler years. But every two-year-old knows these words, I mine, and no. And they use them all the time with varying degrees of whining, hitting, tears, and tantrums. 
right? We don't have to teach our kids those words. They are all bent towards selfishness and sin. And Paul says we all are, and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. You might say, well, does that really matter? Of course we're selfish. Of course we mess up from time to time. But Paul tells us in Romans 6, 23, he says the wage or the cost of that sin is death and separation from God. Paul says our sin's a big deal and it separates us from our creator, our sustainer, and from our God that loves us. And he says it separates us from him now and it separates us from him for eternity. And so Paul says we are all sinners separated from God and yet God is a God of love and a God of relationship. He makes a way for us to be made right with him, a way for us to be forgiven from our sins. Paul in Romans 5.8 tells us, tells us in one of the most amazing verses in the Bible, he says that while we were still sinners, he says while All right, we'll go handheld. Uh, Paul says that while we were still sinners, while we were separated from God, while we were running away from him, he says that Christ died for us. The actual verse, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And so the Bible says we are sinners. We are separated from God, deserving of death, but God in his incredible love sends Jesus to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. So the wage, the cost is death, and Jesus pays the price on our behalf as a sinless sacrifice. And that's why we talk about Jesus so much. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a moral example, but he is our savior. He gave his life for us. He is why we're named living hope. He is our living hope. John in John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John says that God so loves you and God so loves me that he sends Jesus to die for our sins. And if we believe in him, we will not perish, but have eternal life. That's the hope of the gospel, and that's the hope that Lydia hears of. We mentioned Romans 6.23 earlier. The first half of the verse says, The wages of sin is death. But the hope of that verse is found in the second half, which says, But the gift of God is eternal life. And so the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, was the hope for Lydia, and it is the only hope for you and me today. It is a relationship with Jesus. It is surrendering your life to follow him. It is putting your faith in him and making him Lord of your life that saves you. Right? Christian parents... Christian culture, church attendance, small group attendance, Christian friends, fearing God, that alone doesn't save you. But the Bible says it's only a relationship with Jesus that can save. It is through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that your debt has been paid. And it's only in following him that you can be saved. And Paul says it pretty simple in Romans 10, 13. He says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This means if you surrender your life, you say, Jesus, I believe you're who you say you are. I admit that I'm a sinner and I need forgiven. You say, I've commit to following you and you will be saved. The Bible tells us, the gospel tells us Jesus loves us so much he died to pay the price for our mistakes and sin. And so he offers forgiveness, hope, and eternal life to us. But we have to choose to believe it, to accept it, and surrender our lives and follow after him. That's the gospel and that is the choice that Lydia had to make and we all have the choice to make. Luke tells us in the book of Acts that Lydia hears this message from Paul. Her heart is open, and she turns and follows after Jesus. And she is never the same. She goes from God-fearer to Jesus' follower. She goes from knowing of God to forgiven daughter of God. She goes from distant from God to one of his own. And so the question for us today is, do we know of Jesus, or do we know him as our Lord and Savior? I know that almost sounds like the same thing, but it is a totally different relationship. Religion and religious acts is about checking off boxes to earn our way to God. But the gospel is that Jesus has come and he offers forgiveness to us. He has paid the price. He has made a way. And so do we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior or do we know of him? And so our second point and the next thing we see is that Lydia immediately responds and she immediately follows after Jesus. Paul shares, she hears, she understands, and she immediately repents and follows after Jesus. When we understand who Jesus is, what he has done for us, then we are left with a decision. Will we turn and follow Jesus who gave his life for us, or will we go our own way? The illustration I love to use is that of a gift card, and I know many of you have heard this before. But Jesus died and paid the price for your sins, but you have to accept that gift and follow after him in order to receive the reward. In the same way, when someone buys me a gift card, the price has already been paid, but I have to redeem it in order to get the reward. I recently had someone give me a Dairy Queen gift card, right? They paid the price, 
The blizzards have been purchased. But until I take that to Dairy Queen and redeem the gift card, I have not received the reward for that which has been purchased. Without redeeming the card, it has no real value to me. It's just another piece of plastic in my wallet. Right? In the same way, Jesus has paid the price for your sin. He has died the death you deserve. He offers you forgiveness of your sins, eternal life with him in heaven. But you must receive the gift. You must recognize your need for forgiveness. You must believe that he is the one who can save and turn and follow after him. And so for Lydia, she hears this good news of Jesus, and she immediately responds in faith. She turns from her ways, and she follows after Jesus. So do you know of Jesus, or do you know him as Lord and Savior? It says after she turns and follows Jesus, it says she goes and she gets her family. She tells them about Jesus and and about the gospel, and it says that they are all baptized. She is so excited about what she has heard and how her life has changed, she immediately goes and tells others and is baptized. And so that's our, our third point today, and that is this, that Lydia follows Jesus and her life is changed. Lydia follows Jesus and it immediately changes her life. The first command that Jesus gives to his followers in the New Testament is to be baptized, not as a a means of salvation, but as a public declaration of your faith to the world. And you think about Philippi. Paul is soon going to be thrown into jail. The city of Philippi is hostile towards Christians. It's persecuting Christians, but Lydia doesn't care. She follows Jesus and is baptized. And yet even before she can do that, she goes and she gets everyone she loves and she tells them about Jesus and is a witness to them through her words and through her action of of baptism. As we've said, baptism doesn't save you, but it's a step of obedience for those that have chosen to follow Jesus. And it serves as Lydia's first act of obedience. It serves as evidence of the life that has been changed in her. Baptism is a declaration of the world that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you believe in him and that you want to follow after him the rest of your days. We said it before, but that's something you've never done. We would love to help you with that. We've had a, we've had a bunch of baptisms in the last few weeks, and it's been so exciting. It's been a, a joy to be a part of those. We have more baptisms coming up on October, August 27th and September 10th. If you'd like to join us for one of those Sundays, we can, make, we can make those work, or we can make any Sunday work if you need to take that step of obedience. But for Lydia, when she follows Jesus, she is baptized, and she tells everyone she knows and loves about the hope and forgiveness she has found in him. When Lydia follows Jesus, she doesn't huddle in a building exclusively with other followers of Jesus, but instead she immediately goes and tells everyone about her Savior. You see, when you experience forgiveness, when you experience a Savior, when you experience hope, when you experience Jesus, it should lead you to go and share that hope with everyone you know and meet. So Lydia is saved and her life is forever changed. Her response to a Savior that would give his life for her is to immediately give her life back to him. And her family is changed, and the city of Philippi is changed through her. And so I want us to see one last just incredible truth briefly in Acts 16 in the church of Philippi. If you go on and you read Acts 16, you see that the three founding members of the church in Philippi are Lydia, the woman who Paul met by the river, the Philippian jailer who we would meet who is a Gentile, a non-Jew, and a slave girl. That's who starts the church in Philippi, one of the, one of the, most, uh, the strongest churches in the New Testament. In the ancient Jewish prayer book, the sitter, Jewish men were encouraged to pray each morning this. They would say, Lord, I thank God I am not a woman. I thank God I am not a slave. And I thank God I am not a Gentile. Jewish men felt lifted above these kind of people. And yet it's these kind of people that Jesus came to save. And it's these kind of people that God desires to use to share his hope with the world. Jesus came for all people, and he desires to use all people to share his hope with the world. And that's our final point today. Jesus is for all people, and God uses all people to share his hope. The Bible tells us that all mankind, rich, poor, black, white, young, old, conservative, even liberal, religious, irreligious, from good families and from broken families, the Bible says they all have one problem, and that problem is sin. The Bible tells us there is only one hope of forgiveness, only one hope of salvation, and it's Jesus. We've talked about it a lot, but Jesus came and died for all people, and the gospel is available to everyone. Right? So often, we unintentionally, we fall into this trip. We say, well, this person or that person, or maybe I, I'm not a church person. But the Bible is full of those people that aren't quote-unquote church people, but God loves them. He saves them, and he uses them for his glory. And so if you're here today and you don't feel like a church person, please know that God is for you. Please know that he has died for your sins, and he offers you forgiveness if you will follow him. 
And in that, he desires to use you to make his name known. He desires to use you to make his church more what he designed it to be. The first church in Europe and the first church in Philippi was started by a wealthy woman, a slave girl, and a jailer. God is for all people, and he desires to use them for his glory and to make him known. Please don't let the failures of the church, which is full of broken people trying to figure it out, keep you from following Jesus. He is for all people, and he's even for you and I. He desires to use all people, even you and I, to share his hope with the world. God is for you. He loves you. He sent Jesus to die the death that you deserve. He desires to forgive you and give your life purpose. So today, you, like Lydia, you can turn and say, Jesus, I know I have sinned. I know I've done things that go against you, and I believe that you sent Jesus to live the perfect life I couldn't live. I believe you sent Jesus to die the death I deserve, and I believe he rose victorious over the grave. And I want to follow after you. As Paul said, if that's you and you pray that prayer with a surrendered heart, you will be forgiven. And then there are those of us here that are followers of Jesus. In this last point, I want us to know that, that Jesus is for you no matter who you are and what life looks like, but also know that Jesus is for everyone else as well. As followers of Jesus, we don't write people off because they act like they're not interested or they don't fit the mold or we think they are too far gone to ever know Jesus. Jesus came for all people. And we are called to love and serve and share him with all who God puts in, all the people who God puts in our path, no matter their current life situation or the past sins. Paul starts the church in Philippi with this woman named Lydia that he meets by the river, with the Philippian jailer who's a Gentile who he's going to meet in jail, and with a slave girl who was chasing him around, terrorizing him, who he sets free. And so as we wrap up and Emily comes to play some music, I, I just want us to spend some time considering who Jesus is and what he is calling us to do. First, are you here? if you're here, are you a God-fearer? Do you know of God? Do you respect God? Do you think God's a good thing? Or are you a Jesus follower? If you recognize you're just a God-fearer, you have not yet followed Jesus with your life, maybe today is the day that you are ready to turn and follow Jesus with your life. Maybe today is the day that you are ready to trust him and your future and your eternity to him. Just as Lydia heard the hope of Jesus and immediately followed him, then maybe today is the day that, you are, that God is leading you to receive that gift. If that's you, would you turn and follow Jesus in these next few moments? Or maybe you're here and you're not ready to follow Jesus, but you have questions. Would you ask your questions and, and learn the gospel for yourself? Read the Bible. Ask someone you know who loves Jesus. Ask your questions about what it means to follow him. And secondly, maybe you're here and you are a follower of Jesus already, but God is calling you to deeper faith and obedience. Maybe you're here and he's calling you to baptism. Maybe you're here and he is calling you to share his hope with the world around you. He's calling you to use your gifts and resources for the benefits of others as Lydia did. Maybe there's someone God has put in your path and he wants you to share Jesus with this week. Would you take some time to pray for that person, to love that person, to serve that person, and share the hope of Jesus with them? Paul intentionally saw others, and he shared the hope of Jesus. And it changed Lydia's life, and it changed the community. Who is God calling us to share with? So Emily's going to come, and she's going to play. And as she comes, I'm just going to pray for us, and we'll just take a few moments to reflect on what God is calling us to do. Dear Lord, we thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you that you care for us. God, we thank you that you sent Jesus to die the death that our sins deserved. God, we thank you that in you we can experience forgiveness and grace. God, we thank you that you desire to not just forgive our sins and, and to give us eternity with you in heaven, Lord, but you desire to transform our lives and you desire to use us for your good and your glory. God, we thank you that you lead us on right paths for your name's sake. So God, I pray in these next few moments as, as Emily plays, Lord, that you would just speak to each of our hearts. God, with our heads bowed, Lord, that you would, that you would call. Maybe there's someone here that's just a God fear, Lord, that you would call them to faith. Lord, that you would speak to their hearts and reveal their need for you. God, and they would have the courage like Lydia to immediately go and follow you. God, maybe there's some here that are, just have questions. Would you give them the courage to ask their questions and learn more about you? And God, for those of us here that are followers of you and have been followers for a long time, Lord, would you call us to deeper faith? Would you call us to obedience? Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's sharing your hope with someone. Maybe it's just serving where, where we go each and every day for work, Lord. But would you call us to deeper faith? Would you call us to, to be your ambassadors and your sharers of your good news with the world around us? And so, God, I pray that as Emily plays, that, Lord, you would just speak to our hearts. 
Lord, that you would call us to what it is. You would call us to obedience, Lord, and we have the courage to follow. God, we love you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you that you are a God who saves and forgives. In your name we pray, amen. Again, Lord, we thank you that you love us and care for us. Lord, we thank you that forgiveness um, is available in you, Lord. And God, I just pray that you would lead us this week uh, as you would call us to deeper faith as we go. God, we love you and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I have just a few announcements for you this morning before we leave.